Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium the Dean of the Rossier School of Education, Dr. Karen Sims Gallagher. Thank you, and welcome to this very exciting event. I'm delighted to see all of you here today for what I think will be a very provocative panel discussion about globalization in higher education, what it means, and why it matters. But before we get started, I want to acknowledge some special guests with us today. Of course, first and foremost, our 11th president of the university, C.L. Max Nakias. From our Board of Trustees, Dr. Barbara Rossier and her husband, Roger, over here. And Dr. Verna Dotrieve. Um, I'm also delighted that so many of my colleague deans are with us today. And so I see some of them, and um, you're not all sitting where we wanted you to sit, so that's OK. Uh, first of all, um, Dean Marilyn Flynn from the, the School of Social Work. Uh, Dean Ernie Wilson from the, school, uh, the Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism. <laughs> Dean Robert Rasmussen from the Gould School of Law. <laughs> Dean uh, Avishai Sadan from the Austro School of Dentistry. Dean Pete Vanderveen from the School of Pharmacy. Okay. Uh, Dean Madeline Puzo from the School of Theater. Uh, Director Selma Holo from the uh, Fisher Museum. Okay. Did I miss any of my colleagues? Dean Rochelle uh, Steiner from the uh, Roski School of Fine Arts. Thank you. Well, welcome to all of you. This week is a significant milestone for the University of Southern California. The installation of President Nakias as the 11th president of USC is historic, in particular for a 130-year-old university. Indeed, the installation of a new president celebrates the beginning of a new era, guided by the president's vision. In, in, pardon me, in anticipation of the president's installation, we in the Rossier School began planning how to celebrate this momentous occasion. We decided to use the USC 2004 strategic plan, which calls for creating a significant global presence. We decided to support the work of faculty, staff, and students from around the university, and we decided to complement President Nakias' commitment to globalization, both when he was provost and dean of engineering. We believe that a conversation about how our university impacts and is impacted by our location on the Pacific Rim, by diverse communities here in LA and their cultures, and by our academic colleagues and partners around the world, was most appropriate. We also knew that we wanted to support President Nukias's bold vision of distinguishing USC as an undisputably elite research university, a definition which includes acknowledging USC as a global university. Thus, the panel's task for the next 90 minutes is to probe and discuss what it means to be called a global university. Now, we realize the term globalization is contested in some circles and is open to multiple interpretations. So we brought together three thoughtful, experienced leaders, each with very different perspectives and uh, career paths to explore the issues. Dr. Chuan Lee is a Trojan, having received his PhD from our School of Education in 1986. Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee returned to Taiwan, where his career has been spent building a global university from humble roots to international stature. Dr. Kenneth McGilvery is USC's new Vice Provost for Global Initiatives and has been the Secretary General of APRU, the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. In that capacity, he managed a mission of global partnership, assisting like-minded institutional leaders to collaborate in research and scholarship for greater economic and societal impact. 
And our third panelist, Ben Waldowski, has observed the phenomenon of globalization in higher education from the vantage point of a journalist and astute reporter. His insights are now chronicled in a critically praised new book aptly titled The Great Brain Race. But before we begin our panel, it is my honor to introduce the man who will lead the University of Southern California on its own global mission. President C.L. Max Nikias previously served as USC's Chief Academic Officer from June 2005 till August of this year, a role in which he was charged with accelerating the academic momentum of the university. He is credited with recruiting new academic leadership, strengthening the academic medical enterprise, attracting a series of major donations to the institution, creating innovative cross-disciplinary programs, and increasing support for students at the undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral levels. President Nikias was instrumental in bringing the Shoah Foundation, originally established by filmmaker and USC trustee Steven Spielberg, to USC. President Nikias has established uh, the Roy, Edward R. Royball Institute for Applied Gerontology, the Stevens Institute for Innovation, and the USC China Institute. He launched Vision and Voices, USC's campus-wide arts and humanities initiative, as well as a grant program to advance scholarship in the humanities and social sciences. In addition, he enjoys fresh, uh, teaching freshmen about Athenian democracy and drama. President Nikias joined the university faculty in 1991, and from 2001 to 2005, he served as dean of the USC Viterbi School of Engineering solidifying his position as a top-tier engineering school and leading the campaign that included an historic $52 million school naming gift from Andrew and Erna Viterbi. Please help me welcome the 11th president of USC, C.L. Max Nikias. Um, and yes, thank you. Um, you know that this is installation week, like I have to tell you that. Uh, and President Nikias has many duties and many things he has to um, also accomplish tonight. So we're really privileged to have him for this short time, and I want to thank you. Thank so you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Hello, everyone. Uh, two things. One, I, I said it earlier uh, that uh, I am in a battery saving mode. <laughs> saving my energy for Friday. And two, in my remarks, I'm, I tried very hard not to give out what I'm going to say in my inaugural speech. So I'm delighted to be here, and I'm so pleased that this uh, symposium is part of my inauguration week celebration. It's only fitting that USC should host a discussion on the global university. We are truly an international university, and as president, I'm committed to continuing and even accelerating our growth in this area. I want to emphasize this evening that USC already stands on a distinguished history as an international university. Among American universities today, we have the largest number of international students. We welcome well over 7,000 students from more than 112 nations from all over the world. Many of our faculty and senior leaders have international backgrounds, and our schools and institutes concentrate on innovative global initiatives. USC was among the founding members of APRU, the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. USC established the US-China Institute in 2006 and we have significantly increased the number of USC offices around the world. We are now represented, this is what we call the mini embassies of USC, we are represented in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, in Tokyo, in Seoul, in Mexico City, in Taipei, and uh, we have plans next spring to open two new offices in India. As we move forward, the USC Rossier School of Education is certainly doing its part, and I salute uh, Dean Gallagher's leadership. The school has built international study tours into all doctoral candidates programs, and it's established fellowships for global study. 
not only for doctoral candidates, but for the Master of Arts in Teaching candidates. This will give future teachers an international perspective on schools and educational environments. The school has also established their partnerships with universities in Beijing, Hong Kong, and Shanghai to collaborate on educational leadership programs and is working with the Yangpu District in Shanghai on leadership training for principals and in-service training for English teachers. Also, the Rosia School is now working with the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization in Vietnam. Together, they will focus on helping Vietnam reform its education system at all levels. And this is just what's going on at the Rosia School of Education. And keep in mind that we have 18 schools at USC. So you can imagine similar initiatives throughout USC in cinema and engineering and music and business, uh, the Annenberg School and School of Social Work and so on. And when you bring all of them together in the context of a large research university such as USC, a place that encourages cross-disciplinary exchange, you can appreciate the unique potential of our university. So we are certainly up to the challenge, and I, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, President Akias. So it is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's discussion. Our moderator is an Emmy-winning journalist well known to Southern Californians. Val Zavala has been a television anchor and reporter for over two decades at KCET, Los Angeles' largest public television station, where she also serves as Vice President for News and Public Affairs. She has hosted highly regarded and critically lauded local series, including Life and Times and SoCal Connected. Val garnered numerous awards and honors during her career, including 10 LA Area Emmy Awards, six Golden Mics, two Imahan Awards for Excellence, and a Greater Los Angeles Press Club Award, just to name a few. Her impressive credentials as a journalist began with degrees from Yale and Stanford. Please welcome Val Zavala. I am really pleased to be here. I love getting out into the community and doing these kinds of uh, panels because I learn so much. And there's no better place to learn it at some place as rich in expertise and ideas and innovation as USC. So I'm going to uh, launch right into the um, introductions of our panelists. And while I'm reading um, their introduction, they can come up and take a seat. We are gonna have a, sh a discussion um, among the panelists and, I, and then I wanna open it up to questions from you, the audience. So I hope as you're listening to the discussion, please start formulating your own questions as well. And, uh, and then we'll try to, we'll spend about a, a, an hour and 15 minutes or something in the total discussion. But I do wanna reserve plenty of time for your questions. And, uh, and I know KCT has been in the headlines, so I'll be happy to answer questions by KCT after the panel. Our first panelist is Dr. Xuan Li. Please come help forward. President of Ming Shuan University in Taiwan. Ming Shuan was founded in 1957 by Dr. Li's mother, Dr. Li Ming Pao, as a junior college and Taiwan's first women's business school, a radical concept at the time. The school began with 600 students. Today, it is a thriving international university that cultivates talents in technology, humanities, and management, and also prides itself on being a comprehensive university of research, teaching, and service. You're welcome to take a seat, President. Didn't want you to have to stand through your whole interview. <laughs> ah, <Okay>. oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you, you please be comfortable there. The university has over now. The university has over eighteen thousand students, thirty-seven departments, and is Taiwan's number one school in international education with 600 students from over 68 countries. Dr. Li earned his undergraduate degree in English literature from the Chinese Culture University in Taiwan, his master's in management science from State University of New York at Birmingham, 
and his PhD in post-secondary and higher education from USC School of Education in 1986, before it became the Rossier School. He holds numerous honorary degrees from universities around the globe, visiting lecturer at University of Oxford. He's published extensively on subjects of management, marketing, strategies, and higher education. Please welcome Dr. Swan Lee. There. Our second panelist is Dr. Kenneth McGilvray. He is USC's Vice Provost of Global Initiatives. And although he's one of USC's newest Trojans, he is deeply familiar with its commitment to globalization, having most recently served as the Secretary General of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, of which USC was a founding member. And there's, by the way, some literature on that organization on the table here if you'd like to get it afterwards. Dr. McGillivray's background is in senior university administration, particularly with respect to the internationalization of academic research, advancement, and business development portfolios. He's advised numerous universities on how to transform their academic and administrative environments through the integration of global knowledge, skills, and perspectives. He's provided practical implementation and delivery advice to the post-secondary public and private sector and to government on the appreciation and consequences of transnational flows of people, capital, and information. He's also developed st successful strategies to assist institutions of higher education in embracing the concepts of internationalization. Prior to his role at the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, Dr. McGilvery served as Vice President of the Raffles Education Corporation, which is headquartered in Singapore. That corporation is the largest private education provider in Asia and is ranked in the top 10 among private education providers worldwide. Dr. McGilvery has also joined the, has joined the School of International Relations at USC College as an adjunct professor. He earned his BA in English Literature at Carleton University in Ottawa, completed graduate research at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada, and holds a PhD in English Literature from the University of London in England. Please welcome Dr. Kenneth McGilvery. Our third panelist is author and editor Ben Waldofsky, who just this year published The Great Brain Race. I'll do it for you. <laughs> Not that he couldn't do it himself. How The Great Brain Race, How Global Universities Are Reshaping the World. The book has been called a masterful account of the emergence of a global academic marketplace and one that makes the case that open borders are perhaps more important in education than in trade and economics. Mr. Wodowski is currently a senior fellow in research and policy at the Kauffman Foundation, but he spent the majority of his career reporting on education and public policy. Most recently, he was education editor at US News and World Report, where he was the top editor of America's best colleges and America's best graduate schools. Previously, Mr. Wodowski was a budget, tax, and trade correspondent for the National Journal, higher education reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle, and executive editor of The Public Interest. His articles and reviews have also appeared in the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, New Republic, and others. As a consultant to national education reformers, Ben Waldofsky, Wildofsky has written and edited several influential reports, including a test of leadership, charting the future of higher education, which was issued in September 2006 by the Secretary of Education's Commission on the Future of Higher Education. He's been a guest speaker at Google, the Brookings Institution, National Academies, American Council of Education, and more. He graduated from Yale University. My alma mater. He was a media fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and a visiting fellow at Israel's Shalom Center in the summer of 2009. Currently a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution. Please welcome Ben Wildowski. All right. All right. We are in very esteemed company. And I'm going to start off uh, with a question that academics love to start off with. And that is defining what the heck we're talking about. So. Just what does global higher education mean, or what does the global university mean? It is very distinct from an international university. So I'm going to begin with Ben. You've spent a long time uh, putting this book together. It's rich with information. What, after all your work, did you conclude is the definition of a global university, and are we at one? Well, of course we're at one. I mean, I have to say that right off the bat. <laughs> um, look, I mean, there, I, there is no single definition. I guess the, I, the way I would think about it is that we are in a, a global academic marketplace. All the forces of globalization that we 
we, we hear about, that we experience in the worlds of, of business, of culture, you name it, have all come to the world of higher education. And what that means is, you know, in, in brief, and we may go into this more, we have uh, student mobility uh, to an extent that's completely unprecedented in the history of the world. Uh, three million students moving, uh, studying outside their home countries. These are not study abroad students. These are students who are studying for a year or more. Many of them are seeking degrees. Three million is up 57% in the past decade, so huge increases. Many more globally mobile faculty and administrators as well. We have universities mostly in the West setting up branches in the Middle East, in Asia. We have universities from China to South Korea to Saudi Arabia trying to become world class. We have governments pouring huge resources. And of course, in my, near and dear to my heart, because of having been at US News, we have global college rankings. Um, not only in 40 different countries, uh, country level rankings, but we have several major international rankings. And uh, as I say, it's a marketplace. And I would say a global university is a university that is uh, really trying its best to compete and participate in the marketplace. And we'll explore a little more what does that mean. Does it mean that you have a university with branches? Does it mean that you have a university with programs or, or shared degrees? Does it mean that you merge with another university? Oh, we'll explore that a little bit more. Um, but I'd love your thoughts on what you see, uh, um, Dr. McGilvery, as the essence of a global university, as opposed to an international yeah. university. I have views on this. They <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, First of all, I go back and, and define globalization because I think a global university pays attention to those particular trends. So the trends of economics, scientific, uh, technological movement of people, of goods, of capital across transnational borders um, is a very, very important aspect of what's happening in the world today. So those institutions who are aware of that and take steps in order to capture those opportunities, in my view, are global institutions. Um, I think the other thing, I, or the other distinction I would make is the difference between a global institution and, or what's being global and what's being international. I mean, to, to many extents, the, the, the terms are interchangeable to a certain extent. I've always thought of it in this particular way, is that that those institutions that pay attention to globalization trends, the ones I just mentioned in terms of economics, technology, and science, um, those, those particular institutions have a sense of what's going on in those particular areas. What they do then is they internationalize their own institutions in order to put into place particular activities, aspects, research strategies, and other types of strategies that allow them to take advantage of the globalization of what's going on outside their institution. So they don't just send students abroad and say, go see what it's like. They actually come back and change the institution that they're in. Well. Change the culture, not just simply visit sure. I, abroad. Sure. I, I guess what I'm saying is that there's, there's many indicators to what makes an, inter, an international institution. One of the indicators that you hear, and, and certainly you hear at, at USC, is the number of international students that you have mm -hmm. at that. Mm -hmm. But that's only one indicator of what makes an institution a global institution. So all I'm saying is that most institutions that are in this business and do it well have international strategies that they, they bring to bear internally within their institutions that address some of the external factors that's happening out there globally. President Lee, from your perspective as, in, as president of, of a premier university in Taiwan, what does the global university look like from the other side of the ocean? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, so these two gentlemen already said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I still can say something. To me, this uh, international university, that's uh, inter, means uh, uh, inter uh, nations, among nations. Uh, I think is, to me, this uh, international university before Mingchuan, we start from uh, uh, College of Commerce, uh, Mingchuan Co College of Commerce for, for girls. At that time, because uh, nation need to uh, uh, change our uh, agricultural uh, uh, land to industry land. Mm -hmm. So we need so much uh, uh, international trade knowledge. So we uh, set up uh, uh, Mingchuan, just supply that uh, society need. 
so what we call our internet, uh, international uh, college, okay, or university. But you can see the global, global university means is uh, uh, without boundaries, because now we are a global village, yeah, we are a global community. So, so, this, so we have so many things we need to consider, like human right, uh, like it's, uh, equity, or like this uh, justice, so many things we need to discuss will protect uh, uh, so many uh, interests for all over the world. So international uh, uh, college or university, that means that's uh, international trade, uh, course that in international university. So I think right now this uh, global university means better than international university. Uh, Mr. Boldowski, can you think, in the, in the course of your research, you've looked at so many different institutions approaching this so differently. Did you run across any particular university that was taking the global university concept and executing it really well? Gosh, I feel that I shouldn't play favorites. I mean, there are, there really are many. I mean, one of the things that, I mean, it's like people talk about what are, the, you know, tell me about the United States uh, higher education system. Well, you know, what, one of our great strengths, you know, and this is often said, is that we have a tremendous diversity. You know, we have great community colleges and open access public universities and pretty, you know, pretty open access privates and elite privates and elite publics and so forth. So uh, that's a roundabout way of saying there are many universities and they're doing it in very different ways. I mean, I sometimes like to compare the strategies of uh, NYU, New York University, and Yale. And NYU, uh, under John Sexton, a president, very entrepreneurial, very ambitious, uh, um, really has, has big visions of what global education ought to be. And uh, NYU just a few weeks ago opened a new branch campus in Abu Dhabi, except don't ever call it a branch campus because John will get very mad at you. Um, it is a freestanding liberal arts college in Abu Dhabi paid for by the, the, uh, the Emirati government. And th that's a place where you can go for four years and get an NYU degree that is indistinguishable from the degree you get in, in Washington Square in New York. And his, his long-term vision, he'd like to open a, a full-service campus in China. And the idea is he calls it the Global Network University, where there is no longer a sort of headquarters and branches, but there are places that are co-equal. Now, contrast that with, with Yale, where uh, Rick Levin, the president, has also been, been viewed as an important leader. Um, for a long time, Yale has, and, and until now, they have really resisted the idea of creating branches. They just announced a potential partnership in, in Singapore, but it would not grant Yale degrees. They're much more cautious. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear this term, it's, people don't always like this uh, language in higher education, but brands and brand dilution, people worry about eroding their brand, especially if they're at that very tippity top mm -hmm. of the pecking order. But Rick Levin, for example, just to give two examples, he's brought in a lot more international students. I don't think it's as many as you have at, at USC, but I think he said it used to be maybe one in 25 students. He says now maybe one in nine, one in 10. And he says he wants everyone who graduates from Yale to have a, a friend from another country. And on the research level, he's created some very interesting partnerships in China, where Yale, of course, has some high-level uh, scientific expertise. In some of the universities where they're partnering, you know, they're doing well, but they're not at that same level. But they do have incredibly good lab space. It's very cheap. They have very good technicians, also very affordable. So it's a partnership that's really a win-win. So again, just very different ways of approaching this, but I think both quite successful. Uh, Dr. McGilvery, why is it so important to, to, to globalize education? What's at stake here? Well, the global knowledge economy, which everyone is, is moving towards. Singapore is an excellent example of, uh, of a movement away from manufacturing, although manufacturing still is, is a broad base within, in, uh, within that country. But moving to a higher value chain as far as, as, far as um, the skill level that they require, the, the nature of immigration that's coming into that country, the, the way in which their uh, programs, particularly their research programs, are being factored to tie into priorities for, for that particular country. Again, also that it can reach that global knowledge economy and, uh, and bring a much higher value to, uh, to what, uh, what they're able to do within that, within that particular country. And for example, with the Asian Pacific um, 
university association, am I saying that? Asian Pacific Rim universities. What was the motivation? Why, why go through all the time and trouble it takes to get these universities together? What, what was the benefits well, that you were after? I'm glad you mentioned that because I actually, I've only been out of that job for six weeks and I, I, I was going back reading the mission statement of, of, uh, of APRU and I've actually got it down here so I've got it right so I won't <laughs> Now that you're out of the job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to offend any of our members. Um, the Association of Pacific Rim Universities is, is, was 38 members. Under, under my tenure as Secretary General, we added five more members onto that point, and then we closed membership. So everyone's dying to get into that organization. Um, hmm. And we, we, we closed it. I mean, if you can't do it with 42 members, you know, you, you, you're just not Why are they dying it. to get in? What's so valuable about being part of that? Well, it's, it's partly a club atmosphere to a certain extent. You, you, you run with those individuals um, who do this very well. And, you know, as Ben has suggested, you, you were mentioning Yale and, and NUS and the rest of it. These are high flyers, and, and these are individuals who are... And, well-heeled institutions in terms of, of the finance and leadership and mission behind these, uh, these institutions. They need to be global. Um, they have to be. In order to, to, to do good research, uh, in order to be able to play in that, that particular arena, you have to go where the quality research is going on. You have to partner with those institutions that are doing that. Governments are paying much more attention to this in terms of the granting councils and other types of third-party funding that's being provided to ensure that those are happening. And it's also happening within consortiums, too. It's just not APRU. I mean, I could sit here and name off a dozen hmm. consortiums that, that, uh, that have come up. And as you look at sort of the history of consortiums, a lot of them are attached to you know, the Commonwealth, nation states, that sort of thing. So the Association of Commonwealth Universities is one of the oldest um, uh, consortiums going around. International Association of Universities is, is it based in Paris and, and it's UNESCO based. Uh, again, something like 180 members in that, that particular one. The latest consortium though is the International Alliance of Research Universities, IRU. International? Uh, International Alliance wow. of Research Universities. Only 10 members in that one. Yale is a member, Oxford, Cambridge, ATH, and Zurich, uh, NUS. Uh, so it, it's, it's a really elite group that have come together. Berkeley's already is in there too. Um, and the, and the, the purpose for that, it, again, is that they see very similar profiles in terms of, of their goals and objectives as far as the internationalization of their institutions. And they want to ensure that their students and faculty are able to, to gravitate towards those institutions. And so what they've done is they've gone out and developed special relationships. And that's one way of doing it, is, mm -hmm. is driving that through a consortium. Very good. Um, President Lee, the Asian market for uh, education is growing like leaps and bounds. I think in China alone there's, according to Ben's book, 1,300 joint programs in operation. Another 370 programs are, are in the works. These are China, US university programs. Why, is, why, why the Asian market? I mean, and we know, of course, it's because the economy is growing so fast. But is there some other forces in there that is, that is creating such an excitement and such growth between Asian countries, universities, educations, and, and, and American universities? Yes, this is another good question. But it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, one thing we must know, uh, global universities uh, benchmark is USC. The only reason uh, I choose USC, not only because the football, American football, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, USC is the uh, best university we, we can study here, because there's so many uh, uh, international students here. We, I think right now reach uh, uh, 7,000. The, the reason is uh, I choose USC. At that time, uh, when I was a uh, uh, graduate student here, uh, as a PhD student, so I think that made me uh, eye open and uh, open my mind too. Because if I stay in Taiwan all my life, I don't know the, the world is so big. I don't know 
so so many uh, beautiful people here. Okay, so and your society, your organization, the how you you do business, how you run your country. That's whole things. I think the underdeveloping country they need to come to United States. So we call United States uh, like you will see as a, a, a global university because it's really something we can learn. So at that time when I uh, study here, I just like a, a small man stand on a giant shoulder. I can see much uh, further and uh, I can know so many things. So I went back to Taiwan, then I a new man. Hmm. I have new idea and uh, I have uh, innovative thinking. That changed my life. So I must say I thank you very much to USC. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, the very important thing is happening because when I study in USC, I see it's how come? I cannot change Mingchuan to become a different university. So at that time, I decided, I said, I want to make Mingchuan to become American university in Asia. So many people think I'm crazy. They said it's this in, uh, mission impossible because it's, uh, Mingchuan University was non-speaking English uh, uh, university. So, but uh, I have this kind of idea. I think a, there is a well, there is a way. So I, I wanted to do that. So I, I went back to Taiwan, I think it's uh, 10 years ago, then established an international college. So that's what I'm thinking. So I can recruit a lot of uh, international students to Taiwan. Uh, and. Uh, mm -hmm will give them something uh, they can learn from Ming Chuan. Because uh, I hire many foreign uh, teachers there. So this, uh, they all have their global knowledge. So I just uh, local, their, localize their global knowledge. So my international uh, college students, uh, right now we, all, we have uh, over 600. But as a compare with uh, uh, USC, we, we, we only a small potato because USC <laughs> is uh, much more than <laughs> we got. But maybe it's uh, uh, 12 or 14 times uh, bigger than me, me okay? But uh, I, I still is thinking, so I needed to finish uh, what, what mission I should do. So I took 2,000 days. 2,000 days, okay, that's, uh, I don't know, uh, a human being, you ha have how many 2,000 days, okay? <laughs> so it's, uh, I work and work. So I pass uh, the final uh, stage, uh, self-study uh, uh, assessment from the uh, Middle State uh, Commission uh, on Higher Education. Uh, so this, uh, my dream will come true if uh, in November, uh, they announced will become American University in Asia. Really? I think it, what I'm, I'm thinking, because I learned from USC, right? So I just trying to uh, tell every one of you, uh, I think the global university should change to global university. <laughs> Make the B into C, the Croco University. <laughs> okay, this, uh, so this uh, we uh, Croco University, we uh, local uh, globalization, we global localization. Okay, <laughs> so that's reason that I have a uh, sister college relation with USC from our Dr. Uh, Gallagher. Because uh, I think the best way is uh, we, we have so many uh, USC uh, faculty and students go to Mingchuan University. And uh, this is global knowledge. And uh, I send many uh, uh, Mingchuan faculty and students to the United States. 
does local this uh, uh, global localization. This is the way I think the USC and the Ming Chuan will get more advantage and will become super global university. <laughs> then I can tell you want to say something. Yeah, well, I wanted yeah. to just follow up on this yes. question of why there's so much interest. I mean, I think that it's, to me, it's important to make the distinction. I mean, sure, it's always mind broadening to go abroad. I mean, I, I did this and many people do that. I'm, I'm not against it. But I think that we, the, the fascination that we see is not simply go anywhere just for the broadening experience mm -hmm. um, or for cultural exchange. It's because Western universities have become the gold standard of university excellence in the world. And this is Western, Western universities in general and United States universities in particular. People want to come here and people want partnerships with us because we have created the premier university system ever. And you know, it's not, the, it's not homegrown. We stole the, the German research university model developed in the 19th century. This notion of combining teaching and research under one roof with academic freedom, freedom from government interference. We had all these Americans who went and studied there. They came back. They started places like Johns Hopkins, like University of Chicago, modeled on this, uh, this German research university ideal. And we perfected it. And after World War II, for a variety of reasons, you know, uh, government funding, immigrant scientists, GI Bill, we, uh, we became the best by far. So everybody wants to come here. And although the, the balance is beginning to shift, people want to come here, or they want us to take what we offer and bring it to them or they want to replicate what we have and try and create great research universities on their own soil. So I, I think it's just important to understand that, that, I mean, as, as my, you know, my colleague said, you know, people understand that we're in a knowledge economy. People understand that universities are the, the pathway to innovation and to economic growth. So if you want those things, then you have to be part of this marketplace and not just any old university, you know, you need to try and follow the merit principle which means you know, competing and seeking excellence, which has not been true and unfortunately is still not true in many universities in the world. Mm -hmm. Can I just yes, jump please. in for a second? The, the, I, I agree with Ben to, that American universities are the gold standard and still are. Whether they will be down the road is, is mm -hmm. another interesting Absolutely, yeah. topic Very. for discussion yes, in yeah. terms of the amount of investment that's being put in, particularly in Asia, particularly in, in China, into um, into their particular programs. But, but just going back to, to, to sort of validate what, what, what Ben was saying, when you look at the Jiao Tong rankings, and, and that was, I think, in 2003, Jiao Tong started that, that particular ranking. The reason they started that ranking was essentially to find the academic and educational research gaps between themselves and US institutions. That was the reason. It wasn't to go into the explosive ranking mm -hmm. <laughs> frenzy Market. that we're no, all in. It was a benchmarking exercise. It, it was. Yes. It was precisely that. Now, that, that ranking's been pulled out of Jiao Tung. It's, it's now independently handled, although it carries the same name. Um, but it, it's a very interesting way in which the, our, our colleagues in Asia were very astute in terms and very systematic in terms of, of trying to define how they wanted to develop their particular educational system based on the, on the U.S. model. The flip side of that, though, is, and I'll use NUS as uh, National University of Singapore as, as again, a, a very highly ranked institution, um, very Western, very U.S.-centric in terms of, of, of its approach. But in terms of its own branding from one president to the next, and that just shows you how things go, the previous president, Xi Chufang, was extremely global, and he wanted that institution to be a global player. And in fact, in many ways, the reason it's where it is at that point is because of the efforts and leadership of that particular individual. The next individual that, that came in, uh, Prof Tan, who's a medical doctor, who's the current um, president of NUS, changed the branding of that institution to the, being the very best global university in Asia. Ooh. Ah, interesting distinction. And it's a real sense of pride from the standpoint of that institution, and I'm beginning to see that in other ways, that it's no longer as necessary to compare yourself to the, uh -huh. to the gold standard, that they are becoming the standard. Being top standard. in that league is Yeah, well, and, and that's not to say that Yale yeah. won't be there and MIT won't yeah. be there and the rest of it. But, but there is a, a real sense of pride that's developing in Asia for obvious reasons in terms of mm -hmm. its economy, 
um, in terms of, of just the size and, and the number of students uh, wishing to avail themselves of higher education. The other thing that's, that's really burgeoning in Asia at this point is a middle class that is coming up that can afford education. Uh, and will, are, are willing to pay for it. And, and so they are demanding from their national governments the absolute gold standard of, of education. And that's why you see such a drive in some cases to do that, because it truly is a point of pride as well as trying to raise the research and educational bar of these institutions. So it's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon that's going on. So I think we can all appreciate the advantages and, and the wisdom of moving toward you know, globalization in, in education. But there's also some serious downsides and some cautionary tales out there. There are some global university experiments that failed, that cost a lot of money, that, that you know, were shut down. Um, maybe you can give us some cautionary tales in that regard. And then I'd like to explore some of the difficulties, whether it be uh, differences in, in politics, uh, freedom of speech, academic freedom, as well as other cultural issues that institutions have to be very careful about and cognizant of as they move into this global, global era. So give us a couple of cautionary tales from those that have learned, we can learn from them, or as to what not to do. Sure. I mean, I, I guess I should just preface this by saying I'm very uh, optimistic about university globalization. I've, I've been accused of being excessively optimistic. but. I think that this is, for many, many reasons, a, a force for tremendous uh, progress in the world. Now, the cautionary tales have to do, uh, the ones that immediately come to mind have to do with branch campuses, which is really only one aspect of globalization. I don't think it's even the most important one. I mean, people, journalists, myself included, are, tend to go toward those examples because they're really fascinating. I think the movement to create a lot of great universities in China, say, is actually more important than the relatively small number of sort of boutique programs around the world. But having said that, you know, University of New South Wales in Australia goes into Singapore and plans to create a, a big campus and puts a lot of resources into it. And you know, whoops, their enrollment projections were not very good, and they closed down after less than a year. They had a tiny number of students. Uh, America, you know, when Japan was sort of the the, the go-go nation in the 1980s, and everybody was looking to to Japan to teach us, you know, how to do a lot of things. There were American branch campuses in Japan, many of them, and now they've all shut down except for uh, one, Temple University. And again, uh, an economic miscalculation, sometimes just changing markets. There may have been less, less demand for those programs. And in the Middle East, you know, Michigan State recently closed down a, pr a program uh, in Dubai. Again, the enrollment projections didn't pan out. But I think you know, it's important to be cautious about Generalizing, I don't think this means branch campuses are a bad idea or that they can't work out. I think that they are, by their nature, entrepreneurial ventures. And they're structured in many different ways. Sometimes they're profit-making, uh, or they're, they're supposed to bring in revenues. In some cases, like NYU's uh, not taking any financial risk in Abu Dhabi because it's all being paid for by, by, mm -hmm. by the Emiratis. Uh, ditto for a number of Western campuses, Georgetown School of Foreign Service, uh, Cornell's Weill School of Medicine, a bunch of others are in Qatar in this very expensive compound called Education City. It's, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. But again, they are not taking any financial risk. Now, the risk, I mean, just to finish this point, is there, again, may be issues of their, their brand, their, their, their image, their quality. It's very important to them that they not create a second-class degree. Mm -hmm. They also need to maintain their core values, which include academic freedom. Uh, I mean, mo for, first and foremost, so if you're going into a society, I mean, Qatar, for example, it's a moderate Arab society. You know, it's not Saudi Arabia. but. The American universities have done some things that I think are, are important symbolically. They have VPN internet lines, you know, which are unfiltered. And this is a country where there is mild, not, not heavy censorship, but there's mild censorship of the internet. They said that's not acceptable to us. On our campuses, it'll be unfiltered. There are also, uh, I mean, the, the guy from the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern told me he'd been visiting some of the local papers and telling them, you know, you don't have to have a picture of the emir on the front page every day. Um, that some, sometimes some of these were things they were sort of doing out and of what the emir thinks out of habit. No, the emir is, is okay with it. A lot of these things are, are hangovers from the time when it was expected, um, when they had censors actually in the newsroom, you know, physically wow. clipping stories. You know, there's a great series there called the, the Doha debates, which are Oxford-style debates. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was there, I saw posters all over these Western campuses with, by the way, these are with Emirati students, you know, the women, women in, in, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, um, you know, in, in black and veiled, well, not veiled, but, you know, wearing mm -hmm. traditional, uh, you know, uh, clothing. And the, the debate resolution was, this house resolves that Gulf Arabs value profits over people. 
So clearly very much an in-your-face an in mm -hmm. provocative resolution, but I thought that, to me, I took that as a statement of this is, these universities, as their hosts want them to, are going to really put this kind of notion of free, robust debate out there. So you asked about the risks. I mean, I think, in a way, the risk is in compromising your values, and I think that the places that are doing this well, I think, are really trying to, to avoid doing that. Yes. Uh, I, I got to jump Go right in. Go uh, <laughs> And then we're going to get, I love <laughs> President Lee's yeah. opinion on academic yeah, freedom. Right. Yeah. I want to give you all the dirt on UNSW. The, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, ben is right. Um, part, the, there were a couple of other things that are in play there. One, one was, was the funding that EDB, which is the Economic Development Board of Singapore, was not to the point that, uh, uh, that the institution wanted. The other thing is that they were trying to, this was just not a teaching opportunity. This was going to be a research enterprise, uh, which is a total different ball game in terms of, of the costs associated with, with bringing in and setting up labs yeah. and other things that they required in order to, to develop that particular model. The other thing that killed it is a new president came in. Surprise, surprise. And so the new president came in read the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the balance sheet on it, and was very quick. And he, they actually brought him in from industry. So he, he was not necessarily an academic from that standpoint and made a business decision mm -hmm. that this wasn't a good thing. Hugely embarrassing for the Australian government. Hugely embarrassing, even more so for, for the Singapore government, who would, they, uh, they, it, it was a big, big problem. If Bill Tierney's in the room, read Bill's article on this, because he, he wrote a very, very good piece on, on, uh, on that particular um, issue. The, the other thing is Ben is right. I'm biased from a certain extent because I, I, I haven't seen a bricks and mortar operation that's made money. Hmm. Be, be absolutely truthful with you at that point. And you know, you talk to Colin Campbell, who was a vice chancellor at Nottingham and Ningbo, and they went into Malaysia and the rest of it. And you talk to some of the directors at that point. There's been all sorts of difficulties in terms of, of not only setting up the, the issue as far as the regulatory process is concerned, attracting students, attracting faculty, and, and that's the other part is the sustainable part of getting faculty to come mm -hmm. in and stay and within stay your there. particular region mm -hmm. at that point. And that affects quality too in terms of, 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 of the long run of your institution. Um, and then they're c competing with other institutions whose investment you know, outstrips them 100 times in terms of some of those particular regions of national governments building those particular uh, um, world-class or near to world-class institutions. Um, the other whole group we've, we've kind of forgotten about at this point, we're talking sort of mainstream universities, mm -hmm. both public and private, but the private sector in terms of the Apollo Group yep. and Laureate Education. Uh, for-profit, yes. Yeah, yeah. Great Natas, chapter on Kaplan, that. Mm -hmm. yeah, Manipal, I mean, you name them. They're, uh, Growing I'm, like I'm an expert of this in Raffles Education Corporation. I mean, we had a market value of, of about $2 billion in that organization, 52,000 students in 10 countries. Um, and I think probably now they're probably closer to up to 75,000 students. Gosh. Is that organization ever going to be a Yale or a Princeton? Obviously mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Research is it not. Doesn't a, want to be. It doesn't, doesn't need, need to be. be. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But. The, the market return on that for that, because I still got the stock, is about 35%. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't I, have a lot of yeah, stock. But <laughs> I know, I, I read that chapter. Family and friends <laughs> options? Yeah, yeah, yeah really, really. I, I read that I chapter more. and said, I sure hope that my investment group knows about these yeah. the companies. Yeah. They're phenomenal. Yeah. But, but, but that, that is a whole thing that mainstream universities have to keep in mind. Because because first of all, one thing, it's, 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 it's for-profit education, but more importantly, it's the private sector. And boy, can the private sector move quickly where mainstream mm -hmm. institutions necessarily can't. And that's, that's the key thing. When you're developing curriculum and programs and the rest of it, thank God we're at USC because things move relatively quickly here. You get into the, the large public institutions and it's three years before the right. committee's put together. And then from there, you, you're, you, you know, uh, who knows when it's going to get out? President Lee, are there are there these you know for-profit colleges, universities? They usually uh, emphasize healthcare and business. You know, very practical professions. Are they? Uh, are you seeing them in Taiwan? Well, Taiwan, we are only a uh, non-profit organization. No matter you, you are, are public right. or private. Oh, really? Yeah, public so, or private? That's yeah. Right. So, okay. I I don't think it's a uh, 
uh, like the global university, uh, you uh, you would put it maybe in China or in in anywhere. I don't think that going to be um, very profitable in the future because uh, uh, you can see the China so many. Uh, Students, the good students, they cannot afford that the tuition fee is very high, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, especially you have a branch there, you, know, you don't have a very good faculty. Every your good faculty stayed in USC. They, they don't want to go there. Right, right. <laughs> so this, uh, so so it's a very hard uh, to uh, guarantee your your quality education mm -hmm. there. So that's the reason is uh, I'm doing something. So okay, uh, I. I make this uh, my university to become American university in Asia, and uh, I, my tuition fee is not very high because we are a nonprofit organization. So this, uh, I give mm -hmm. every good students they have chance to get the quality education. So this, uh, like this, uh, talking about the uh, ranking, uh, I I think this uh, ranking is very important, but it depend on your your the, uh, point of view. It's a, if a Chinese point of view or American point of view or British point of view, every every kind of uh, uh, in the ranking, you don't you believe you don't believe okay because it's, uh, that depend on you only for reference purpose. So this, uh, I I do think is uh, I don't know the ranking you emphasize only research or teaching is very important because uh, mm -hmm. and especially teaching outcome. Okay, this, uh, uh, we, we must know that teaching the outcome is good. If teaching outcome is bad, no matter how good your faculty is, students, they, they don't uh, know anything you, you're talking about. That kind of education, I don't think that's quality education. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the best way we will do this, uh, uh, that the students, they, want, they have money and they pass TOEFL, uh, GMAT, on uh, GRE, they can join USC. USC is very smart, rather than join you or use online uh, master degree or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Because they don't need to stay here. Uh, they, they stay at their hometown. And they uh, still they can get the best uh, education because all good faculties here. They can use, use uh, the uh, uh, video conference and uh, talk to uh, the students, no matter where you are, because the internet, that's a, uh, uh, that's a the war tool. So everywhere you can get a, the quality education. That, that's the way I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, that's the perfect segue into the other issue that I want to bring mm. up, and that is technology. Bricks and mortar may not have worked, but technology perhaps could could be the key to creating these networks at fairly low, relatively low cost. Um, what are the, the, the benefits, the, the downside and the upside of online education? USC School of Education now has an online degree. It is a USC degree. It's a master's, is that correct, PG? Master's that is able, anybody from any, anywhere, but mainly across the country could take it, but you do have to be associated with a local school so you can get practical experience while you're getting your online instruction from USC, but you could be anywhere, Kansas City, whatever. So technology is really, really promising. But again, what are the limits or, or, or and both the promise of technology in terms of spreading um, education globally? Well, I mean, I think when we talk about this kind of thing, it, it often goes hand in hand with the for profits uh, for now. I mean, there's certainly plenty of traditional institutions. Are they the ones are, at the cutting edge of this? They're expanding very quickly. I mean, uh, you know, there are all kinds of companies, many of them that you've you know, heard of in the States, you know, Apollo Group, which was the parent of the University of Phoenix, or Laureate, which was mm -hmm. used to be the parent of Sylvan Learning, and which now has a whole bunch of for-profit universities that's been buying up around the world. Many of them have some combination of brick and mortar facilities. They're not branch campuses, really. They're really local institutions, but they're run by these international companies, many based in, in the States. Many of them are using distance learning as part of what they do. And you know, I think that a lot of them, you know, people are not typically using distance learning to go and study political philosophy. You know, mm. They're using them for practical subjects. Uh, again, the same thing that one finds a lot in the for-profits. I think from what I've seen, the quality is a mixed bag. I mean, it's very popular. It's, it's a very, uh, again, I think it's what we've seen in, the, in this country. You know, there's, 
there's going to be a progression. I think there are going to be some very high quality players there. But I think that it's, um, it's almost hard to, to generalize because there's so, much, um, there's so many different things going on. It is true, though, that I believe, uh, forgive me, I, I don't remember my own statistic, but in the book, I think that um, I, 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 I cite uh, the, the statistic that there are more Chinese students studying in Australian universities online than there are actually in Australia. Oh. And again, I, I, I'll have to double check myself on that. But you know, the online obviously, wow. uh, it obviously creates you know, huge uh, low cost uh, abilities. And the question is, are you delivering the kind of rich content that is right. going to deliver the sort of value that students really want? And is the teaching really method want. effective? Right, it? and I guess I think, I mean, to be honest, I think that it's not gonna substitute for, you know, for, for many students that they're gonna wanna have the in-person mm -hmm. experience, whether it's the experience actually physically being in a different country, or the experience being able to interact with professors. You know, if you're doing any kind of high-level laboratory science, I mean, you know, the elite graduate students around the world can really write their own tickets. I mean, they are the backbone of the global research enterprise. And you can't do that uh, online. It's just not gonna happen. So I think we're still gonna see very heavy demand for, again, for these top-tier institutions. But I think that can go hand in hand. We're seeing a huge expansion of mass access, as we've discussed, and that's very important. Everybody understands that they need not only the high-level research, but they need a more educated population. And sure, online is one way to get there. And Except I'd love to, um, uh, and I'll, yeah, yeah. but in the meantime, I'd love to um, have you open it up in just a moment um, after uh, Ken's comment to questions from the audience. So raise your hand and we'll get somebody with a microphone to you. Yes. Yeah, ju just a couple of points. Uh, we're talking about some experiments that, that didn't go so well. Um, <coughs> U21 is another university consortium and mm. they spun off a private company called U21 Global which is headquartered in in Singapore which is essentially a business school they their their main product was was management degrees um, this was conceived within about 20 universities and it was to be co-badged it was a very very uh, complicated process and the rest of it we were involved in, when I say we, the University of British Columbia, where I was before, uh, back in that, that particular time, were involved in that program for five years. We never saw a dividend once out of that, that particular program. Part of the difficulty was price point. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of market and where they were going, there was just no one that could afford wow. these, these particular programs. And so when you look at, at the opportunities available to us, and use China as an example, China in the last five years has have doubled the number of, of students that they are admitting undergraduate into their national universities. But that's still only 20% of school leavers in that, that particular country. In, in India, it's 11%. So just think what's being left on the table mm -hmm. in terms of that. Now, is everyone going to be able to afford a USC degree or a Yale degree or whatever? No, it isn't. And that's why Laureate, Apollo, and all these other ones uh, Manipal and others are, are able to develop programs that, that address the specific needs, both regional as well as national needs that, that the country has defined where it, it, it goes. So, and distance education plays a role in that mm -hmm. too, and it's, it's just not external providers coming in that are, that are doing it. It's, it's countries and, and homegrown institutions that are seeing those markets out there and are tapping into those markets via distance education within their own within their own regions and communities. Wonderful. Are there questions here from the audience? We'd love to hear from you. Yes, uh, this young woman over here. The microphone's coming to you. Hold on just a second. Let's give you the mic so we can hear you. Hello. Hi. Um, I am a current graduate student here at USC studying student affairs, but I kind of want to know from you and your perspective, what do we as future professionals need to know, whether it be our biggest challenge going into the field or what we need to know dealing with these students who are part of local universities, as you put it? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. What do, who needs to know what? Future professionals as future we're entering the field. Future professionals entering the field of? of higher education. Higher education. Oh, okay, very good, thank you. Oh. Future professionals entering the field of higher education. What the key things you need to know about the globalization Anything. <laughs> a piece of, okay, oh, oh, we could turn this into a little, okay, piece of advice for future professionals going into the fields of higher education. What piece of advice would you give them or what do you think they should understand? Um, when you, are, are you in Rossier? Is, that, is yes. that your program? Very good. I'm looking right at your dean here because, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> um, 
uh, Karen and I actually have a lot of views on on uh, on this particular issue, and and your program actually you're lucky to be where you are, uh, because it's a school that's paying attention to uh, to these issues. Part of of uh, activity that that Karen and I have been involved in is has been an APRO activity, which is bringing together education deans, um, and we've had a number of, and and Karen's provided a lot of leadership for this particular group. And it's been a very, very interesting process that's, that's gone on. And it's, it's, it's just a, a, one of those wonderful aha moments where you're sitting in a room with a number of, of, of deans. And we, we had about 22 uh, deans of education uh, in a room in Auckland. And we're sitting there and we're sort of discussing at that point what are the competencies that, that, that need to be inculcated into students, particularly within your discipline, that um, would help you become better teachers? Um, and then we've turned it the other way around in terms of, of what are the competencies that we would want to see in both students and teachers in the way in which they're actually teaching and imparting that, that particular knowledge. And it was a fascinating discussion that went on. Karen's much better at, at explaining this than I, than I ever would. Um, but what I got out of it was that the profession is looking very closely in the way in which it's imparting uh, teaching, or, or how teaching is being handled and, and being imparted uh, as a profession across the board. Um, but at the same time, I think universities, and this is a good example of this, and, and I think John is trying to do this also at his own institution, is to develop a certain set of competencies that we would like to see instilled in, in, in students over the life of their degree program at a particular institution. And out of that would become a certain set of learning objectives that, that, that we could perhaps measure in terms of, of the way in which the student progresses through the program. And, and I could go on and on about this, but, but there, it's, it's a very exciting thing, and I, I, I think we, we, you're in a very good position, um, and we certainly need individuals such as yourself that, that both can reflect on how they learned as students. And it's a generational thing to a certain extent, too, which is, which is most interesting. And that was the aha moment for me as I looked around at the generations within that particular room. And it was very clear to me that, that some just, I, I won't say didn't see it, but didn't see it in that particular light in terms of the way in which students are learning or wish to learn. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yes, question here in the front. You're and then over maybe oh, I'm I can. Sorry. Yes, President Lee. I can answer your question. I hope you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the uh, future higher education, especially we call that a global education, higher education, you not only know your own culture, you must know the global culture. Because you do business no longer uh, doing inside your, your country. So everything we, we use, uh, it's made in uh, China or made in Taiwan or made in USA. But uh, I do think this, uh, you must uh, go there and uh, see their society. And, uh, and this, uh, then this uh, seeing is believing. And uh, so you, you don't stay the, uh, in classroom, uh, read your textbook. Then you, you be, become a, really an eye-opener. you surprise what you can get. And at, at that moment, you got so many. You get so many things you cannot imagine. Okay, because that that's my experience. I share my ex experience with you. So this, uh, you, you're going to change your personality, and uh, you're going to have a new uh, plan for your future. Mm -hmm. So th that's just what I'm thinking. I, I I do think this is the best way to do it. Yes. Question here in second row. I think there's a microphone nearby. There we are. Uh, I wanted to bring up a, a somewhat different uh, issue from what you've already mm -hmm. discussed. It seems that now there is, in fact, a superabundance of graduates in some fields in India and in China uh, from colleges, that there is an unemployment problem that's developing. Uh, and there's a kind of disjuncture between the types of training and education that are being provided and the actual lo local economies and the ability of societies to absorb these new graduates. 
Um, I had a particular case of that in China where we were asked to help develop curriculum for a new program that was opening up and I said, well, we would be glad to do that, uh, but could we talk to a, an employer council first so that we could have a sense of where these graduates might be used? And we were told that that was not done. In other words, in some of the more traditional societies, there really is philosophically as well as practically a gap between understanding the content of educational programs and then the nature of the labor market itself. And I think uh, uh, U.S. degrees are no longer a guarantee for uh, graduates returning to their home countries. Again, the competition for available positions is increased in higher education. So my question is, in thinking about the global university and the global economy, how do we make a better connection between the types of programs or the initiatives that we offer in other countries and the capacity of those countries to absorb the graduates that we produce? Hmm. That's, a, that's a problem that exists here wow. in the U.S. Well, too, I was actually. Say, it does. And, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, you know, you could tell people, no, sorry, you cannot come and, and, uh, and, and get your, your history PhD because there's a glut in the market and we're not going to let you do that. But we don't, we don't, in this country, we certainly don't control people like that. And, uh, you know, maybe you could argue federal, you know, federal aid shouldn't, uh, shouldn't go to those students. But I think, you know, markets aren't perfect, but I think, you know, uh, to some extent, I think if there's demand for programs, if people want to mm -hmm. come and get, uh, you know, engineering degrees, even if the market is very tight when they go back home, uh, I'm not sure what we can do about that. I'm not sure what we should do about well, that. Well, interestingly enough, perhaps some of these for-profit companies are maybe a little bit more in touch with the job market well, and, yeah. and student demand. Yeah, exactly. And that, that would be my comment. Actually, that's a very good, good comment that, that, that you raised. The one thing that jumped into my mind when you were discussing that is that quality assurance has not kept pace with the, the privatization of higher education. Um, it's a big problem, a uh, big problem in a lot of the companies I just listed in terms of, you know, Manapel, Laureate, even U21 to a certain extent, although um, QA was, was, was not a big deal in that particular case because there were other external groups that were coming in that were, were uh, validating that MBA. But having said that, it's, it's, it's not a perfect situation. And what's happening is a lot of these private companies are going in and are doing precisely what Val has suggested, is, is, is addressing specific local needs and providing the type of, of technology or technology enhancement or other types of applied learning um, that are meaningful for those local economies so that, you know, dropping in a Marshall MBA or, 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 or something of that nature is not necessarily going to be the ticket in that, that particular area. Having said that, that doesn't mean that there isn't a market for that. It's just, I, I think institutions that are going out there need to really study their market and determine where is their best point of entry. And it goes back to the other issue of price point. Who can afford mm -hmm. these sorts of mm -hmm. things? Um, and it's no good going out and spending all your recruitment dollars on the rest mm -hmm. of it in an area where, in fact, there's just not going to be the income to support that sort of thing. Yeah. Question here in the third row. The, mm -hmm. And we'll get a microphone to you just a moment. Hold on. So we can all hear you. There you go. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for a very interesting discussion. We were talking a bit about technology, and I often hear about <coughs> online degrees. And I'm wondering, because the technology already exists, and I understand we are um, actually engaged in some projects where we actually have virtual classrooms, faculty member here, classroom here, with a faculty member and a classroom in another country, classes happening simultaneously, with classes and students engaging. And I don't understand, or maybe I do understand, but I see that more as the future or as a middle point between an online class where you only engage with a faculty member um, via email, which I think is sort of at the bottom, and a classroom experience where you're actually in the classroom, and perhaps that really is for the, the most elite students who one can afford to pay, and two really should be in the classroom in the physical presence with a faculty member, because there's a lot that goes on. Mm -hmm. And, and those are, there are students who really need that time and effort of that faculty member, even at the undergraduate level. 
but I think there's a middle point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear some feedback on where is that middle point? How can we provide for those students who maybe aren't quite the most elite of our students and requiring of that investment, but are at the same time do need investment and training from the undergraduate all the way through the graduate mm -hmm. levels. Exactly. Well, one of the exciting things about technology is that the very best professors in any given field can suddenly be accessible to thousands and thousands of students in any given year versus one. So the question would be, why wouldn't um, all students, not just those who can afford Yale tuition, why wouldn't all students, why shouldn't they have access to the best? Now, this is not good news for employment among professors because, you know, technically you, you could have just, all you need is a few good ones and they could take care of the whole country theoretically. But, but it's a very, a very good question in terms of, of access. And I agree too, the idea of just emailing online is not a very appealing thing to me. But there are some really innovative things being done. And in fact, I think that the program developed by the School of Education for their online masters is, is not emailing back and forth. It's actually a, very, it's a video conferencing and interactive uh, opportunities and so forth. Um, so I think, I think that middle ground is, is evolving now and it's, I think it's a matter of who gets there first and who experiments first and, and, how, and how it works. But I'd love, um, it, you know, Ben in particular has probably seen more <laughs> of it than I have. Or perhaps there's some online uh, innovations happening um, at, at President Lee's University. What, what, what's yeah, going so on we, there? Uh, we call our classrooms uh, e-classroom. Ah. Yes, that means... Uh, oh, uh, you call them e-classrooms? Yeah, because so we have a 365 classroom. Every classroom we equip for this uh, uh, online uh, uh, video conference. Mm -hmm. So if uh, today we make a speech, then I can let all of my uh, students, they can uh, uh, live to receive everything that we are saying here. So they so, don't have to be, they can watch your speech later? Uh, no, live. They even watch it live. Uh, can yeah. they also watch it later? Sure. So sure. they can sleep in? And yeah. Then... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, but it's uh, very, very important. Uh, this kind of uh, idea is really is, uh, uh, not too many uh, universities. They have this kind of equipment. We, we got it. So we can uh, do what uh, you, you suggest. Because it's, uh, if we cooperate with uh, uh, USC, then as a USC the professor uh, can, can, can have a video conference with us uh, discuss some difference. Because right now this, uh, you can see this, uh, we, uh, uh, USC may be training a lot of MBA, uh, okay, this, uh, or Stanford or Harvard. And they go back to Taiwan or China or to Singapore. It's, uh, they cannot uh, uh, use all the uh, knowledge they, they learn from the United States. They must have uh, some kind of a localized all mm -hmm. they, they learn from USC and find out what's the difference between. And then they can do their job very, very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, can, yes, please, by all means. You go first. Ben. Well, just very briefly, I mean, I think with technology, I mean, I'm all for it, you know, I mean, I think technology holds huge promise. And again, I've seen some of what's happening with the, the Rossier's uh, master's program with the private uh, for-profit firm Tudor as a partner. It, it's very, it's fascinating. I think, though, that we have to, we can't be too sort of uh, panglossian about all this, you know, the devil's in the details, you know. I mean, even at the very best places, MIT made a big, a big announcement several years ago. It was going to create what they call the open courseware program. All of its curriculum is sort of mm -hmm. is online, still is. but uh, it yeah. still is, but you yeah. know, it varies greatly. Some of it's just, you know, not much more than a syllabus and some of it's a full-blown course. And, you know, it's not like you're some kid in Nigeria and you want an MIT education, you can just go to the website and kind of figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so there's just a lot that happens. And frankly, you can put a video, I, I, I discovered this talking with, with Karen Gallagher, you know, putting a video in the classroom so that you can watch it whenever you feel like it in your pajamas, but it's a 50 minute lecture. Well, you know, it's hard enough keeping kids interested in the lecture hall. Forget it when you're at home. So you have to rethink delivery of instruction. Again, it holds huge promise, huge potential, but I don't think we should make assumptions that it's going to be, be super easy. Yeah. Uh, you raise a very interesting point, and, and I think uh, two, two things I would comment on. One is, is a, a lot of 
the distance edge is, to use Ben's word, glossy and, and, and that. It's, it's high-end stuff, and it, it's meant for a specific market. It's meant for a specific price point, uh, and it's part of a, a strategy of an institution, a school, a faculty, or whatever that, that has decided to, to invest that kind. But there's always an expectation that there's going to be a return on that, that investment. So that, that's one end of the, the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, though, is, it, well, the, the mid part of that spectrum is what you're suggesting. And, and many schools, including USC, Viterbi, and others, and, and, and uh, utilize this type of video conferencing, mm -hmm. which is very important. It's, it's particularly utif utilized in rural areas, where, in fact, you have a number of, of campuses that are far distance apart. They may be part of the same institution, but they have branch campuses around. In that so in in large countries and I've, I believe it or not the place this is used a lot is Russia hmm. and and uh, oh, Vla yeah. Vladivostok um, <laughs> Far Eastern National University is is they have perfected this to 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 an end they have hundreds of smart smart classrooms that 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 they are doing and so they're doing a lot of this around um, from that standpoint the other end of the spectrum though is what I would call distance education for international development. So where institutions make a commitment to particular countries, developing countries, that, that, that can't afford mm. the high-end stuff. And so through USAID, through, through Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA, through IDRC, through AusAid and other World Bank, Inter-American Inter Development Bank, these types of organizations um, provide funding to allow institutions who have an interest in this type of thing develop online programs. Many of them offered through satellite um, and to, to particular pinpoints in particular countries that allow them to, to uh, have this go on. But that's, a, if you like, a particular social commitment that, that, that institutions make at, at, uh, at that point. So there's, there's many points along the continuum and depending on the type of institution you are. And what, what I find with global institutions is they're at all those points. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a couple more questions, and then I'm going to have final thoughts from each of our panelists. Yes, this young woman here. Good afternoon. Um, I'm curious to know what the panel thinks about uh, my question, which is, from the perspective of Western universities that hope to internationalize in the East, particularly in Asia, what do you think are important strategies for retaining the faculty that they initially attract abroad? You know, I've learned um, recently that it's up to sometimes four years, maybe five years, and just being that many branch campuses in particular don't have um, the brick and mortar institutions that we do, for instance, here in the States, how can they, how can faculty um, be incentivized to stay abroad, you know, and thus build um, a more effective curriculum, um, a culture at the institution, and a more supportive community for students? That's a very, very good point because obviously faculty is key to quality and getting them there, number one, is important. Getting them to stay for more than a year or semester is number two. And then over time, that ultimately what, what creates an incredible university is a community of scholars that know each other for so long and have had a moment to gel. You've, you've written about this specifically in your book, Ben, right? Yeah, I mean, it's very tough. You know, uh, it's one reason why, it's one of the reasons why I feel despite the the interest factor in branch campuses, I don't think that that's probably where the, I think they'll continue at some level, but I don't think that's where the, the big movement is probably gonna be long term. I talked to a woman named Mariette uh, Westerman, who's a very distinguished art historian at NYU, who was the first provost of their Abu Dhabi campus, and she, she said to me, and I think this is the quote, you know, the faculty is the university. That, is her, that was her number one job, that was what everybody was fretting about, is how to get people to come over and to stay, and maybe not for 10 years, but even for, you know, for more than a semester. And you know, I discovered actually after the book came out that uh, she left the following year. Um, you know, and I think she, I don't know how long she was gonna stay, but she certainly was hoping to stay for a few years, but for family considerations, personal reasons, I don't know exactly what she left. And there's lots of reasons, and particularly if you're going into, you know, I mean, Saudi Arabia, you know, it's not a garden spot. And uh, Kaust is this incredible world-class institution but to get people who want to go there and who want to stay, um, I was discussing this with somebody earlier today, it's really hard. But they do use financial incentives straight out. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. no, I should have said, I mean, certainly, that's, you know, they will tell you it's not as much thing. as you think it is. 
I don't know. I mean, they won't really, it's hard to Depends get numbers. Depends on what we think it is, right? You know, maybe you get, I mean, let's say it's an expat sort of package, expatriate package, so you might get maybe a 30, 30, 35 percent salary increment, but you also would have your kids, you know, private school tuition paid for and your housing paid for and a couple of business class, class trips back home every year. Wow. That's the sort of thing that I heard about. It's not bad. And, you know, it's a nice way to live. Some people like it. Um, you know, you're living sometimes in compounds. I mean, I'm thinking of the mm -hmm. Middle East here. It mm -hmm. really varies mm -hmm. a lot. I think it's, it's, the situation is different in Asia. Um, you know, I, I, that's really all I can say is that it's, it's a challenge. I think it's going to be um, hard to overcome that, you know, uh, in, to, to really create a much larger number of places than we have now. Yeah, uh, I, yeah I think... I, 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 Good point. And, uh, but it, it works in two ways, too. I mean, it's always going to be challenging sending faculty out to, to external locations, particularly if they're in exotic areas and the rest of it. That, that, and Ben's example of Kaust is a perfect example where, where there are challenges in terms of trying to get people to stay for We should explain that Kaust is the... King Abdulazi University of Science and Technology. It's outside of Jeddah. It's about yeah, a, built from an scratch, an incredible yeah. compound. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. $10 amount billion of dollar endowment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, incredible. Yeah. And they so, want to just, inst almost, they want to just almost instantly create this world class university, you know, within a matter of years that's from right. scratch. It's we'll taken them three years do. to get a provost, though. So it's, because <laughs> <it's, laughs> they keep losing them. So that's, that's part of the, the, the difficulty. The other side of that coin, though, is, is current faculty we have here in the U.S. who are being attracted to go back to their homes because of incentives, because of the increase in quality of education. Um, that is becoming a real issue. Mm -hmm. So what I would underscore that is the retention of faculty. And a lot of attention has to be paid by global institutions to ensure they can keep the cohort that Val has just suggested. Yeah. That is so important to the academy to ensure that, that, that you have that richness, that you have that, that depth. But it's cherry picking time. And, and it's not only in terms of the economy that we're seeing here in the US in terms of publics and privates and, and, and that, that type of thing where in fact there's a lot more availability of people on the market who are looking um, but the other issue is very strategic immigration policies by national governments who are targeting people either to return back to their, uh, to mm -hmm. their home countries and targeting very high profile research people who have track records and providing some very distinctive incentives to get them to come back to uh, the home country. No, I think that's very important. I mean, all I would say is that's not about branch campuses. That gets to the question of what should you know as a higher education leader of the future? You should know that you're in a global marketplace and it's a okay. tough competitive world out there. I mean, China, I think, is what you're probably thinking of, which is the Chinese economy, of course, has boomed. They're putting a lot of resources into their university. They're that's attracting right. many overseas Chinese who've come here, have gotten PhDs, who've become successful academics. And they're trying to bring them home. Uh, they call them sea turtles, which that's I don't right. speak Chinese, but it's a homonym apparently in Chinese for a returnee. Yeah. And that's who they're after. And this doesn't have to, this is not to do with American universities trying to get their faculty to go someplace. It's um, universities that are trying to become great, like corporations that are trying to get the yeah. best talent from yeah. wherever they can. China, China has two policies: the 211 and the 9, 985 policy. And uh, the 211 policy was was policy I think started back in about 1995, 96. Um, which had identified about 100 institutions that it wanted to, to raise to national standards. And so you hear the concept of key laboratories. It's those institutions to which the key laboratories are, are assigned. The 985 uh, policy was started in about 1998. It originally was only 10 institutions. And the whole idea behind that was to raise that to world-class standards. It's now up to 39 institutions that they wow. do. But the interesting thing about that is they have three categories within the 985 standard. The first category is world-class. There are only two mm -hmm. institutions in that, in that category at the moment, which is Tinghua and uh, Beidou, okay. Peking University. Fudan, who you would imagine would be up there, is not. It's in category two. And, and so there's... And yeah, that's there's killing some, them. Well, yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it is. It's, they're just dying because they want to be in too. But the investment in, in just tier one alone has been about, over the last three years, has been about four billion U.S. dollars just into that category. Right. So it's, it's significant money that's going into this. And it gets back to the issue of trying to attract people back to, uh, to China. 
and they're, they're being successful. Thank you. I'm going to take a moment now to have final thoughts. Um, like all rich panels, we could go on and on. There's so much we didn't touch on, and I know I wish we could get to all your questions, but I do think that now's a, a wonderful time to ask for final thoughts from each of our panelists. Uh, anything you might want to say that you didn't get a chance to or any thoughts that occurred to you from our audience? And we'll begin with President Lee. Well, I, I think the global uh, education is uh, very important. I, I think you're joining the one of my discussing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a ah, very good question. Uh, <laughs> because I did uh, answer your question before. But uh, these two gentlemen give you more. That's much better. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think the global university is uh, very important. But uh, we must think one thing. Uh, what I'm talking about is a global university because it's, uh, you, you, we, we learn so many things from uh, global university. We must localize become the, what we can use on our hometown. That, that's what I'm trying to say. So mm -hmm. this, uh, you can see this, uh, I have uh, so many examples I did mention before. Just, just like uh, the, the banking, there's a uh, HSBC. Uh, they said it's a world local bank. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. that, that's the reason they said uh, you must localize all you learn from the glo globalization. And uh, before, I think uh, 50 or 60 years ago, this, uh, uh, American banking trying to set up uh, their branch uh, in Taiwan. At first, uh, they hire so many uh, uh, like a USC, the MBA, or Harvard, or Yale, MBA, and, but they cannot work there mm -hmm. because it's, they don't know the, everything about the uh, local uh, thinking or customer's uh, habit or everything they don't know. So finally, uh, they rehire a lot of local bankers because they know their job. But I, I do think that, uh, this is uh, something that before they go, to that job, they must have some kind of a training. And then let, let them know uh, if uh, they want to get a job done, what the best things they need to do. They need a full uh, prepared for, for, for this work. Uh, so I, I think this uh, uh, global university, uh, university is uh, uh, one thing is very, very hard to uh, accomplish. Uh, that's uh, the best uh, faculty to go there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the reason I think this, uh, uh, maybe it's, uh, in the future, uh, global university in Asia or in any place, they need to prepare some kind of uh, uh, local uh, professor and, mm -hmm. and get an uh, MBA or PhD here, uh, go back to teach there their own people. I think that that's the way uh, can solve this kind of problem. But as a, if you, uh, I think the second things we can do, we can hire a lot of uh, retired uh, professors. But uh, but uh, you you know it's, uh, it's not so easy because uh, 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 every country has their, their difference, especially uh, living standards. Mm -hmm. So this uh, they don't have a good place to stay and good things to eat, and they are very lonesome. Uh, I always can sing this, are you lonesome to lie? Yeah. That, that's not very good. So they very easy. Uh, they, they, they just miss uh, their hometown. They'll go back home. Uh, so and they, really, they don't have friends. It's not so easy to make friends. Yeah. So, so I, I think the global university is uh, the, very, very hard to maintain their quality. That, that's the, the, the things that I'm thinking. It yeah. comes down to good friends and good food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> final, final thoughts, Ben and Ken. Um, for, for me, um, uh, Beth Garrett, uh, I don't know whether she's here, but oh, hi, Beth. There. Be Beth did a provost retreat um, in August, and I, I wasn't part of, of USC at that time, but she kindly invited me to, to, to come. And I made a few remarks at, at that thing. <laughs> As I said to Beth later, I think they all fell flat. But, but nonetheless, uh, one of the remarks I made is that everybody's global now. Mm. And in, in a way, it's true. Um, you go to any website for any institution, they're all touting global, global things. 
Um, I didn't mean that in a pejorative way. It, it, I wasn't trying to uh, belittle that. Any attempt that any institution does to, to do something global is great, in my opinion. No matter how small it is, no how, how insignificant it might be, some institutions just do this better than others. Uh, this is one of those institutions. That's why I'm here, and I'm, in many regards, I'm sure that's why you're sitting there too. Um, and it's trying to, to inspire others to, to do that. So that's one of the reasons you try to, 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 to run with those institutions that, that accept and, and are able to, to embrace that type of vision. That doesn't mean you give up on the other institutions, though, that, that, that don't have that. So I think one of the major parts in, in uh, being a globalization uh, or being a global university is leadership. Mm -hmm. That is the key thing. If it doesn't start at the top, then it's not going to happen. No matter how much is trickling at, at, at that point, you, you need someone within your organization that can articulate and lead the vision on behalf of, of the institution. So don't underestimate the power of leaders in this. And, and I also acknowledge student leaders, too, mm -hmm. in this, too, which is extremely important. Those individuals who get it, who can inspire others and mentor others, uh, that's hugely important. The other point I was just writing down here, and it's my last point and I'll be quiet, is that national higher education policy will become much more difficult to define and implement without a clear understanding of global context. Mm -hmm. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that. And that's, that, that takes it to, to a national level at that point. Unless you understand that particular point, you're going to have a hard, hard time getting off the, uh, the starting blocks. And our final word comes from... Sure, Daniel well, I'll, I guess I'll try and squeeze in a couple things, three things. Uh, the first is that I'm, why I'm, I'm excited and optimistic about this sort of era of university globalization is I think that we are slowly but surely seeing the, the principle of meritocracy become established around the world. I think that individuals, and I'm not saying it's perfect, I'm saying it's an incremental but forward-moving process, Individuals can get ahead more than ever based on what they know, not on who they are, where they come from, who their family is, what their background is. And institutions also you know, can benchmark themselves against others and can improve and can compete. And I think that, unfortunately, and we haven't talked about this too much, but there has been you know, a certain amount of concern about this, about the competitive threat posed by other countries. You know, we hear this in the West, and we hear this certainly in the United States, that somehow the rise of Asian universities, for example, all these PhDs that are being earned in science and engineering and technological fields, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to keep up? You know, and it's this notion that somehow if others are getting ahead, you know, we must be falling behind. And one of the, the, the central themes of, of my book is that this is fundamentally misplaced, that this alarmism is, is, a, is a big mistake. And the, the, the key point is that uh, increasing knowledge is not a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that's not like silver or gold. It's not finite. It's something that can spread and can grow. So more smart people in China with PhDs is good for us. It's not bad for us. Uh, and that's partly because knowledge is also a public good. It's not something that you can easily keep within your national borders. It's something that innovators in other countries you know, can take advantage of, that academics elsewhere can. So I think that it's very important that we not, out of these uh, unfounded fears, create barriers, whether it's, um, I mean, barriers to movement of students to or from countries, immigration, visa policies we haven't gotten into. There's a lot right, I could say right. about that. Um, I think it's a, it's, there's, it's a time of, of great opportunity, and the competition that's out there is real, and we have to compete. But I think we should be energized by the competition, again, because we're not all fighting for some finite resource. And the, um, and the last thing I would say is that I think you know, the reason that we, we have to prevent what, what I call academic protectionism is that the, you know, if we look to the future, the key to innovation and the key to economic growth for everybody is going to lie in the freest possible movement of people and of ideas. And that's both true on, on college campuses and beyond. So I think you know, we need to try to uh, remove whatever impediments there are. And I think it's a very exciting time. Mm -hmm. That's a terrific point. And I have to say that after reading your book, that probably one of the most uplifting messages that came through is that as we look at the world and how many people are still in poverty, and you can get very depressed about that, and there's a crisis everywhere. At the same time, this incredible thirst for knowledge, this desire for knowledge, this willing to pay for knowledge, the willing to invest in education, 
the growing middle class, it's all about knowledge, and that is not a finite resource, as you said. And the more people who know more, I think the better off we're all going to be. And I want to thank our panelists for a really provocative and informative discussion. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Very, very appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ask you just to stay there a moment, um, all of you. I I want to have a, a a big round of applause. I think this was this lived up to all the expectations we had. You know, I, I want to make the point that just as our panelists pointed out that. In, that great faculty are the heart and soul of a great university. Great panelists are the heart and soul of having the kind of evening we've just had. So it doesn't have to stop. It, th this portion does, but I know that all of our panelists will be happy to uh, talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. There's a reception back here, and I hope that you will enjoy it. And I really appreciate your coming tonight. Um, I've learned a lot, and I appreciate the time and effort that you, all, you four put into this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you guys are terrific. Yes.